reading is from the 63rd chapter of Isaiah, beginning with the 7th verse, found on page 679 in your pew Bibles. <clears throat> I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us, and the great favor to the house of Israel, that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became the Savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the second second chapter of Hebrews, beginning with the 10th verse, found on page 1090 in your pew Bibles. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who are all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Gospel assigned for this Sunday is a reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Now, after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt remain there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt have I called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. And then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. In 
early December 1986, I took a day off work to drive with my then five-year-old son, Samuel, up into the mountains to cut our Christmas tree that year. We left with a paper bag of Thanksgiving turkey sandwiches, a thermos of hot apple cider, an axe, a saw, and extra pairs of woolen socks. We drove in our VW bus for nearly three hours far up into the Cascade Range in Northwest Washington State, stopping to eat our lunch and visit with a hunter that we met. The day was clear and cold, and we could look back toward the west and see the San Juan Islands dotting the ocean and the fog blanketing the valleys. Finally, we came to a rise that I could not, and the four inches of snow coaxed the old bus up. We put our gloves and coats and stepped out into the cold, crunching snow. Now, my son Samuel, he loved to be outside. And he loved the snow, and he loved Christmas, and I guess he loved his father. There are times when I can do without the snow, but I love the mountains and the clear air, and I love Christmas, and I love my son. We searched, and we hiked, we had snowball fights. We cut our tree, and I dragged it up to the road while Sam pelted me with snowballs. We loaded it into the bus, we played, we looked at deer and what Samuel said we're bear tracks. We shed our coats from all the plain, and finally we sat in the open door of the bus and sipped hot cider, Samuel dropping snow into his to cool it off. My five-year-old son, he told me that he loved me, and I told him that I loved him too. On the way home, we spotted a pair of bald eagles circling over the Skagit River and stopped to watch their graceful flight. And I told Sam that he was a lucky boy to be able to see them, because many people never will see a wild bald eagle flying free. I considered myself lucky to be able to see the eagles, to be able to go into the mountains with my son, be able to stand by the river with him on my shoulders so that he could get a better view. Ten days later, just a week or so before Christmas, and Samuel has come down with a bad cold, maybe from that day up in the snow. He is coughing and crying in the night so that I wake and go down the hall to be with him. There are tears in his eyes. The coughing hurts, and it makes him cry, and the crying makes it hard for him to breathe through his congested lungs, and it's dark, and it's a little frightening. I give him some medicine, and as I rub mentholatum on his chest, I think of how fragile and how innocent my children are. He tells me that it hurts, and I tell him it's no fun being sick, is it? And then my son said to me, Dad, I don't think I'm going to get better. You'll get better, I said, in a few days. But as I sat there rubbing my son's chest, I questioned myself, how do I know that he will get better? because it's just a bad cold and nothing more, because unexpected tragedies always happen to other people, but never to me, because God would not deprive me of the joy of my family. And I thought, this is just how it begins for some families. This is just how it starts. The sickness of a child or a parent easily dismissed at first, nothing to worry about. 
and they don't get better. And I thought how quickly and how easily and how unexpectedly the circumstances of our lives can and do change from the joy of the day in the mountains to crying in the night and how adrift we sometimes feel in the midst of things we cannot change and cannot explain. Four days ago it was Christmas and the angels were singing over the hills of Bethlehem, peace on earth, good will to all, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. Four days ago and now the soldiers of King Herod march through Jerusalem in search of the Christ child. Not to kneel down and worship, but to murder. And in their wake, they leave dead every boy child, two years old and younger in Bethlehem and all the surrounding region. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they were no more. The gospel lesson this morning makes me realize once again how fragile are my earthly joys. How my family that means so much to me now could as quickly as an automobile accident, as violently as a wildfire, or as unexpectedly as a bad cold that was more than a cold, be swept away, leaving only bittersweet memories. And then what would I have? And where would I turn? And would the Christmas star still be able to brighten and warm my world? How fragile are our earthly joys. How fragile are our earthly lives so easily carried to and fro by the chances of fate, by the Herods of this world and the Herods within each of us. And yet I believe that the message of Holy Innocent Sunday, although at first may seem only a message of senseless evil unleashed on the world, is rather a message of hope. And the hope is this. That the evil that Herod intended did not prevent the good that God was bound to do. The hope is in the fact that the Christ child escaped, that God's purpose was not foiled and it cannot be foiled. The hope of Holy Innocent Sunday is that God had a plan for God's Son that God had a will for God's Son, and nothing on earth or in heaven, not any Herod, not Satan himself, will prevent God and his will from taking place. The hope of this Sunday is that the destiny of Jesus Christ was preserved by the power of God. It was not God's will that every boy child in Bethlehem be murdered on account of Jesus, that happened only because of the evil and the sin of a fallen human being. God's will was rather that Jesus grow and learn and gain in wisdom, as Luke says, and be baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River and preach and teach and heal and minister and raise the dead. And finally, when the time was accomplished, when God said it was time to die a criminal's death and to rise again, securing our salvation and completing the will of God. How quickly our human circumstances can change. How quickly and unexpectedly, sometimes for the better, Sometimes in tragedy, our fortunes ebb and flow. 
We may feel like we are just cast adrift in life to be taken wherever the tides of fate go. But the gospel this morning tells us that we have an anchor. And he is Jesus Christ, the child God was bound to save, the child bound to save us. When the Herods of this world or the Herods within each of us get the better of us, when evil or injury when tragedy or simple bad luck come our way, when the innocent suffer senselessly, and they do, our hope is in Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and lived our lives and made it through to the other side of the grave. Our hope is in the one who outsmarted, overpowered, and got the better of evil, and with a sudden and unexpected turn of events, rose to life three days after his death, and now calls us to follow in his footsteps, to claim the victory, to overcome evil with good, to rest assured that we are not adrift, that no matter what, for those who believe, God is bound to do us good, to finally bring us through it all and to himself, and nothing on earth nor in heaven, not life nor death, will prevent God from working God's will out for you and for me. Amen. Amen. Continue with the hymn of the day. I invite you to stand as you are able. <clears throat> 